In 1958, Pontiac was on life support. Sales were crashing, dealers were fleeing, and General Motors was preparing its last rights. Just one year later, a 5-inch engineering gamble called Wide Track. It not only saved Pontiac but rewrote the rules of automotive design forever. The decision seemed reckless, corporate suicide to some. What happened in that desperate midnight meeting? Why did every car maker scramble to copy it? The answer begins here. Late 1950s, Detroit was a battleground and Pontiac was losing on every front in free fall. Showrooms sat empty as buyers turned away from the brand's heavy, uninspired cars. In 1958, Pontiac's U.S. sales collapsed to just over 217,000 units, a drop of more than 100,000 from the year before. That year, the brand slid to sixth place in the national sales race, its lowest position in decades. Dealers facing unsold inventory and shrinking profits began abandoning their franchises in droves. More than 20% of Pontiac dealers, roughly 350 to 400 storefronts, walked away between 1957 and 1958. Many switched to rivals like Chrysler, whose forward-look models with their sharp fins and futuristic lines captured the public's imagination and dollars. Pontiac's lineup was saddled with a reputation for blandness. Ads and showroom posters promised reliability, but the message fell flat against the excitement of the competition. Internally, GM executives debated whether it was worth keeping Pontiac alive at all. Some called the division terminal in dealer council meetings. With sales in freefall and the dealer network crumbling, the brand's very survival hung in the balance. The crisis demanded not just a new car, but a new way of thinking, something bold enough to break Pontiac out of its tailspin. Past midnight. Inside Pontiac's executive offices, the clock had slipped past midnight. Seaman Bunky Knudsen and Pete Estes sat alone, surrounded by stacks of engineering sketches and sales charts that read like a death sentence. The prototypes for the 1959 models looked ungainly. Wide bodies perched on the old, narrow chassis, wheels tucked awkwardly beneath swollen fenders. Knudsen, restless and blunt, stared at the clay models and saw the problem instantly. The car looked timid, off-balance, nothing like the bold statement Pontiac needed to survive. He turned to Estes with a simple, dangerous idea. Push the wheels out, way out, to the very edges of the body. No other General Motors division had attempted such a move. Standardized body panels and shared frames kept costs down and kept change to a minimum, but Knudsen was ready to throw out the rule book. Estes, equally exhausted but convinced, agreed. In that moment, the two men committed Pontiac to a course that would defy General Motors' hierarchy and force a complete re-engineering of the car's underpinnings. No memos, no boardroom consensus, just a late-night pact between a general manager and his chief engineer, betting the future of the division on a wider, more aggressive stance. By dawn, the order was clear. Pontiac would break from the pack, whatever the cost. Pontiac's engineering team faced a monumental challenge, push the wheels out by more than five inches, and do it in less than a year. Pete Estes and his crew tore into the blueprints, knowing the old frame was useless. They moved the frame rails outward, reworking every crossmember and mounting point. The front track grew to 63.7 inches, the rear to 64 inches, wider than anything else in GM's lineup, and even a few inches broader than a Cadillac. Suspension geometry had to be overhauled. Longer control arms were forged. Their pivot points shifted outward to match the new stance. Coil spring seats were relocated, and shock absorbers found new homes, all to keep the wheels planted at the farthest edges of the body. The rear axle was stretched with longer tubes and extended shafts. Wheel hubs were spaced farther apart, and Pontiac specified deeper dish wheels to fill out the fenders. Brake drums did not escape the overhaul. Each one grew by an inch in width, requiring new wheel offsets and contributing to the car's broader footprint. Even the wheel wells themselves were reshaped, carved wider to house the new geometry. Every change meant new jigs, new dies, and a scramble for suppliers to meet the revised specs. 
The wheelbase stayed at 124 inches, but the wide track proportions were transformed. The result was a car that sat lower, looked wider, and promised better stability before it even left the assembly line. From the factory floor to the dealer lot, nothing about the underpinnings of the 1959 Pontiac was left untouched. The wide track was not a styling trick. It was a ground-up re-engineering, executed under impossible deadlines by a team betting their careers on every measurement. Pontiac's gamble played out on the test track long before it ever hit Main Street. With the clock ticking, Pete Estes and his engineers hustled prototypes out to GM Proving Grounds, desperate for proof that all the late nights and retooled assembly lines would pay off. The numbers came in fast and clear. Compared to the 1958 chassis, the 1959 wide track cut body roll by nearly a third, a figure that magazine testers repeated in print, and one that engineers measured with every sweep through the corners. The front and rear tracks, now stretched to 63.7 inches and 64 inches, made the new Pontiacs feel glued to the pavement. Staffers at Road and & Track and at Motor Trend, notorious for their skepticism, found themselves praising the car's planted feel. One period review called the wide track more sure-footed than anything in its class, while another noted the car felt stable, with noticeably less wallow. Cornering speeds crept up, and for the first time, a full-size Pontiac could outhandle its own GM siblings. Skid pad numbers, rarely published in detail, hinted at gains of up to 0.05 G over the previous year's model, a small but meaningful leap in an era dominated by straight-line cruisers. The new geometry was not just about width, it was about confidence. Drivers reported the car tracked true through sweepers, resisting the kind of lean and wander that plagued other big sedans. Estes's leadership, once questioned by GM's upper ranks, now looked visionary. The team had delivered a car that not only looked different but drove different, and they had done it in less than 12 months, against every expectation. The data in the engineering logs became the backbone for Pontiac's next move, turning technical truth into a marketing sledgehammer. The wide track revolution did not stay locked in the engineering bay. It exploded onto billboards, TV screens, and showroom floors. Pontiac's ad agency, McManus, John and Adams, seized on the car's new proportions, coined the name Wide Track, and splashed it across every piece of promotional material. Print ads stretched the Bonneville, Catalina, and Star Chief wide across the page, their split grills and low planted stances daring buyers to compare. Commercials drove the message home. This was not your father's Pontiac. The split grille, a bold new face, became the visual signature for the entire lineup. Dealer brochures boasted about the extra inches and the sports car feel that came standard. Every element, from color choices to chrome trim, was designed to emphasize width and confidence. The campaign did not just sell cars, it sold an attitude, turning the wide track from a technical detail into a badge of honor. Buyers flooded Pontiac showrooms the moment Wide Track hit the market. Sales soared to 383,320 units in 1959, vaulting Pontiac from 6th to 3rd place in the national rankings almost overnight. Dealers who had once threatened to walk away now scrambled to keep up with demand. Rival executives at Ford and Chrysler watched the numbers roll in and realized they had been caught flat-footed. By 1961, both companies widened their own track dimensions, hoping to catch up. The impact reached the racetrack, too. Pontiac's new stance gave them an edge in NASCAR, with entry lists swelling as teams switched to the wide track platform. Industry analysts pointed to R.L. Polk data as proof. Pontiac's gamble had paid off, reshaping the full-size car market and forcing every competitor to rethink what a family car could be. The revolution was no longer a theory. It was reality measured in sales charts and race results. Every car on the road today owes a debt to Pontiac's 5-inch gamble. A wide stance is now industry standard, proof that bold engineering still shapes how we drive. In an era craving originality, Wide Track reminds us, true innovation does not just survive, it becomes the new normal. <laughs>